Please note that all of what is discussed within this video should only be interpreted as speculation. No matter the mounting evidence against a specific party, nothing has been formally ruled in a court of law. I do my best within this video to adhere to using speculative language opposed to speaking in absolute terms. If at any point I slip and speak as if something is fact when it is not pertaining to my own life as I have lived it, please disregard that as simply human error. Also, please note that the vast majority of the script was written and recorded within a week of Shannon's response being released. I had made a few connections and discoveries that other creators have since made after my main recording was already finished. If I do not give credit to a piece of evidence, it's only because it was already included in the initial recording. I've made sure that any subsequent discoveries made by a third party and not by myself are properly credited within this video and within my description. I had to make a lot of edits, inclusions, and addendums because more and more information started coming to the surface. Thank you so much for your patience, and let's get into the video. I know a lot of you on Twitter told me that I shouldn't even dignify Shannon with a response, and I'd usually agree with you. But because not everyone has a Twitter, and YouTube is my main platform, it has left a handful of my YouTube viewers confused by some of what they saw in Shannon's video. I feel like, at the very least, I should be allowed to not only talk about my side and to disprove some of the more egregious examples of misrepresentation, but to also come clean about a few things and to be open and honest about my past. I think that's fair, and unlike last time, I took my time on this response. I'm not going to go over Shannon's video point by point, that would take forever, and I'm not trying to make y'all watch another two hour video. I just wanna say my piece and not just end this chapter, but close the entire book. This shit is a novel and it's terrible. Shannon's lawyer sent me an email a few weeks ago, threatening that if I did not remove every mention of her and her brand from my social media, that she would be forced to take me to court for defamation. They also asked me to make no mention of the letter they sent me while doing so. So essentially, I was to remove every instance of her name, every allegation I had made, and I would not be, quote, allowed to say a damn thing about it, putting me in a very uncomfortable and unfavorable position. I refused, and then her video pops up. Shannon starts off her video by saying this. If you are seeing this video, it means one of two things has happened. Either one, my lawyers negotiated with Emily's lawyers and we reached a private settlement, which resulted in some form of retraction. Or two, I took Emily to court for defamation and came out the other side. Neither of these things have happened. It's a flat out lie. I have no idea why she chose to leave this in, but I'm kind of glad she did because it gives us a peek into what was probably her overall plan. In the letter that was sent to me by her lawyer, and don't worry, I'll get to the lawyer in a minute. Her lawyer states, if you publicly comment on this letter or the matter discussed herein, we will take that as a rejection of our offer to engage in settlement negotiations and will proceed to litigation. And earlier in that clip, Shannon specifically said that if you, the audience, were viewing the video, it means we either settled in or out of court, most likely meaning I would have had to abide by her original request to remove all mention of Shanthony and stop speaking about everything. So that leads me to believe Shannon wanted to get me to a place where I had to not only mysteriously delete all of my allegations, but also to zip the lip about the situation entirely, all while she eventually released that fail of a video, and I would be allowed to do shit all about it. This unnerves me greatly, as it demonstrates her overall motives here. Shut me up by way of legal intimidation, then tear me down publicly, and watch me squirm and fester in the hell she would have wrought. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. Shannon's lawyer, who I will not be identifying publicly, belongs to one of those law firms that specializes in things like removing negative reviews, removing unfavorable articles, and, I roughly quote, helping their clients control the narrative about their brand and business. It seems to me, just by going over their website and, like, their client reviews, that their main tactic to controlling the narrative is by way of sending long and threatening letters to scare people into removing their reviews or posts or what have you. It seems like most of the time, this is all it takes. It seems like what happens is that the clients pay a flat fee to co-write a scary legal letter to their detractor. The detractor doesn't want to go to court, so they give in. I refuse to do that, and I think Shannon, now having no real recourse, because I don't think she wants to go to court either, she threw a temper tantrum and said, you know what? Fuck it. 
I'm taking this bitch down with me. And then she posted her video. This is further evidenced by the leak of her original unedited Google document. This unedited document is most likely authentic as it references a private transaction between Shannon and Skittles Juice, an artist she had commissioned in the past, a transaction which Skittles Juice publicly proves took place. I'll get more into this unedited Google document later as it reveals several very suspicious pieces of evidence. In the letter I received, Shannon alleges that I was the one solely responsible for her having to abandon her YouTube channel, thus losing her primary source of income. I think most people can agree it was not my allegations alone that ruined Shannon's reputation, but the way she chose to handle them. People were already suspicious about the way she handled the LolCal leaks, as her story, as we now know, was a complete lie. After I came forward, Shannon made a number of social media missteps, if I can even call them that, that I feel are much more responsible for ruining her reputation than just my allegations alone. Yes, disappearing off the face of the internet was not a good move, but she had a lot of heat coming down on her all at once, so I don't think that alone had much of an impact on her reputation as some might believe. Telling her friends not to defend her was also quite strange, but not within the realm of unbelievability because, as we've seen in the past, when a public figure is cancelled, for lack of a better word, they create a kind of cone of shame that drags down everyone associated with them, especially if those people chose to defend the cancelled influencer. So her asking her friends to not defend her is not that big of a deal on its own either. I think the two most damaging things that she did were one, try and blame the LolCal leaks on a stalker spoofing her IP, which means without even asking to see the information LolCal had to implicate her, she immediately acknowledged those posts would appear to come from her computer without any question. And two, very quickly removing a large chunk of her old storytime videos from public viewing, conveniently right after I came forward. Now, I believe she deliberately did not delete the stalker video, something she even points out in her new video, as it was something I drew direct attention to in my original allegation. I think she felt if she left it up, she'd appear more forthcoming, all while she sneakily removed a large handful of videos very shortly after my video went live, and then continued to remove more videos as the days went on. Shannon claims that all these videos videos had actually been privacy claimed for months beforehand and that she had proof that she would only provide in court for some reason. Sure, maybe one or two of those videos were privacy claimed, I can buy that, but why would all these old, very specific story time videos have privacy claims on them? They were just her telling stories and drawing. Why would something like that be privacy claimed? Especially since Shannon used aliases and changed identifying details within these stories. And why would these videos all happen to come down within a few days of each other if the claimant had been attempting to claim them months prior? And something like that is really simple to prove. If she was able to meticulously research my entire social media existence and flash it up on screen for the world to see, then why couldn't she just have quickly flashed all the privacy claims she'd received for those specific videos? What's interesting to note is people have suggested that Shannon purposefully butchered the links to some of my videos in her description to make it appear as though I was trying to sneakily delete things. Shannon heavily implies that the vlog clip she used of me walking around, incidentally not where I lived at the time, were clips from videos that I hastily deleted right before I came forward with my original video. This is just definitely not true, and she probably knows that. I want to be clear that previously, I had actually misread my Social Blade stats when replying to someone on Twitter. I had initially seen this chart of my channel's overall video view growth, not realizing that there was a much more detailed chart on a different part of my Social Blade page. And initially, I was racking my brain. I'm like, what video, what 1.2 million views did I delete? And then I remembered I actually privated a video, and here's proof that I privated privated this video on June 1st, which is actually one whole day before the LolCal leaks even came out. And I know the timing seems kind of serendipitous, but I swear it's just one of those weird cosmic coincidences, and the video in question is wholly unrelated to this whole fucking debacle. And the reason that the view count on the video doesn't match with the negative views on my social blade is because you also have to account for the positive views I received that day from other videos. This video is about a girl I knew in middle school who actually dug through the trash to take out a sketch of mine and pass it off as her own. And I'm gonna be honest, the reason that I privated it was because I felt my commentary was a little bit on the mean-spirited side. And it really wasn't that bad. I'm sure the video is archived somewhere so you guys can go find it and watch it. But in an effort 
effort to try to be funny. I felt like I came off a little bit judgmental. And just overall, it kind of put a bad taste in my mouth. The girl in question had actually bullied me at a certain point, so I had this really negative image of her in my head. And because of that, I didn't really see her perspective or try to give her the benefit of the doubt. And I just didn't want that negative version of me on the channel, and I felt like I could do better. I'm just going to say, this is not the first time that Shannon has projected something she was allegedly guilty of onto me. Specifically in the law cow leaks, Shannon on more than one occasion accuses me of lurking and self-posting, just as she was doing. So she wasn't just fighting with herself on law cow, she was also purposefully posting my content to make it appear that I was using the site in order to garner views. Weird. Where have I heard that before? Oh, that's right. Shannon did that. In fact, that was why she was called out on Law Cow in the first place. I also find in her unedited document, she talks a lot about how she thinks after her video comes out, I will either try and deflect blame, play the victim, try and delete evidence, or and this really kills me, she said that I created a false narrative so that no matter what is said, Shannon would still be the bad guy. Does any of this sound familiar? creating a false narrative? Like taking all the horrendous harassment and abuse that was done onto me and turning it into her own personal sob story? A sob story that she posted not three days after I briefly mentioned having a stalker on my Twitter. That made it so if I ever tried to speak out about what happened to me, people would accuse me of lying because, hey, that's the same thing that happened to creep show art. Huh, that does sound familiar. I feel like all that Shannon's video proves is that this woman has stalked me incessantly for years. It was a desperate smear campaign to get anyone on her side that she could, even if that meant including embarrassing and wholly irrelevant information, a lot of which I've spoken about publicly before. Half of the, quote, evidence she supplied was from long past deleted or defunct accounts and videos, things she would have had to archive when they were first available. She took posts I made as a child, a mentally ill child that was going through through constant and drastic psych medication changes, evaluations, as well as multiple misdiagnoses, and she used this information to attempt to smear me now as an adult. Because as we all know, the things we do as children directly relate to the kind of adult we will become. So if you were dramatic on the internet when you were 12, then that must make you a liar as an adult. Sorry about the heavy sarcasm there, it's just such a ludicrous notion. The YouTube channel A Copy Art made a fascinating discovery of this really interesting clip from one of Shannon's past videos. I believe the following clips just showcase how double faced Shannon really is. And the funny thing is, it is her own word. It's f***ing wild how people treat this literal child online. Like, there is a creator who is literally 14 who people want to call every name in the book because she acts like a creator who is 14 years old. She is 14 and people are having post threads about why she is the worst person in the world. And I'm just sitting there like, that's a child, guys! People often forget that pretty much until you are about 25, your mind is in a constant state of flux and you are constantly learning and changing and growing into yourself. People act like who you are and what you posted when you were 13, 14, 15. Like that represents you for the entirety of your life and that you are going to stand by it to the end of the world and you aren't going to be and act like a hormonal person who is being ravaged by puberty and how terrible that shit is. Back when I was 14, I was writing a story, a full on 30 page story about being in love with Gerard Way and made up an entire life where me and Gerard were together. And yes, at some points, that story did get steamy. Now, some part of my very stupid teenage hormone-fueled brain knew that I shouldn't share that story with the world because I would be made fun of until the cows come home. If I had made the mistake of uploading that to fanfiction.net, then that story would be used today to expose me in some way. Like my puberty fanfiction and fan art of me with an adult man that I was in love with because I was a hormone adult teen going through puberty, that would be used to expose me as a an adult. So Shannon, you, in your own words, acknowledge that literal children should not be demonized and labeled as terrible people for making a mistake because their brains are still developing. She uses a cringy fixation I had on my teacher when I was 13 as a way to set up her scene that I must be an awful adult. Although she supplies absolutely no recent examples, not one, of any toxic or negative behavior. As anyone who's been on incompatible psych meds or have gone through complex trauma can tell you, 
value, these things can turn your brain to absolute chaos. And it worsens further if you are a hormonal child struggling to find a sense of stability in your world. Not only that, but one of those medications I was taking back then, Abilify, which I was taking in high doses for many years, actually came under legal fire multiple times for causing thousands of its consumers to develop gambling and sex addictions, as well as a myriad of other compulsive behaviors. In 2016, the FDA even put out a drug safety warning for Abilify, noting that its consumers might experience, quote, uncontrollable urges to gamble, binge eat, shop, and have sex. Now try giving a high dose of that medication to a prepubescent child and see what happens. Clearly, I was already dramatic and cringy. I didn't need a medication to boost all of that. Obviously, this doesn't mean Abilify bad. It just means these side effects were very common and that Abilify obviously wasn't compatible with me because I was experiencing some of those common side effects. However, this doesn't at all excuse my behaviors because it was still me posting those posts, therefore I am still responsible for them, but it does give some explanation for why they happened in the first place and why, once I was off Abilify, my life gained back stability rather quickly. I was given Abilify for an initial diagnosis of depression, and I believe that my subsequent diagnosis of bipolar disorder with obsessive compulsive tendencies only came about because of the side effects I was experiencing on the Abilify. There was only about a six to eight week window between being prescribed Abilify and my then psychiatrist diagnosing me with bipolar disorder. In Shannon's video, she tries to make the claim that I stated I had been using heroin since the age of 14. Emily didn't do drugs and was in fact very against drug use. She was not addicted to cocaine at 14 like she said and she never abused drugs until after Anthony and her dated and broke up. Jesus Christ, it's even worse than I thought. I thought she said that I had claimed I used heroin since I was 13 but I guess she just throws cocaine in there because why the f*** not? I actually did try crack cocaine, but I was a much older teenager when I did that, and I certainly didn't say that in my video. What's interesting is the fact that she is misremembering a fact about my life that I did not include in my video, but that has some kernel of truth to it. And you know what? Maybe I posted about that experience somewhere online and I'm just not remembering it. But the part that's really weird to me is that she takes this information about my life, then purposefully twists it so it sounds more extreme. Then she pretends it was something that I claimed in my original video and just talks about it as if it was fact. This leads me to believe that Shannon knows even more about me, more than what was included in the video, the Google Doc, or even the un edited Google Doc. The channel Hannah Needs to Yell caught Shannon doing the exact same thing, except this time when she does it, it was in reference to me being fired because an explicit video was sent to my boss. I also just want to point out a few misquotes in Anthony and Shannon's retelling of this whole situation. Anthony and Shannon say that Emily was fired because someone sent a video of Emily camming. That is not what the f she said. Emily said that her company was sent a compromising video of her. Anthony and Shannon are the ones who said that that was a video of her camming. They try to say that Emily said this. They even put the word camming in quotes on screen to imply that they were directly quoting Emily talking about this. Emily stated in her video against me that someone posed as a client and sent an inappropriate video of her camming to her boss, but because she didn't start camming until 2014, a year after, we know that can't be true. But Emily literally did not say that it was a camming video. And send them a compromising video of myself. Anyway, actually in her unedited document, she brings up yet again that I had stated I was using drugs since I was 14, and then goes on to show a photograph of me when I was around 18, 19 without any track marks. Using that is proof that I lied about my drug use. Well, first of all, Shannon, you can also start and smoke heroin, so that throws your argument right out the window. And that's possibly why this unfounded claim, like many others, was scrapped from your final draft. But second of all, I never claimed I was using heroin since the age of 14. I claimed I had been abusing drugs since this time. Sometimes I would abuse either the psych meds I was prescribed or, more often, the sleeping aids. In Brandon's response video, he cites an incident where I was covered in black paint and was saying I couldn't wash the darkness off. I can recall times of mental breakdowns where she'd be covered in black paint and would be trying to keep it as to not let the darkness escape. 
This was because I had taken too much of a prescribed sleeping aid in combination with another psych med I was not supposed to be taking anymore, and it caused me to hallucinate. Anthony was obviously present, initially thinking I had not taken my medication, but I eventually fessed up to him that I was in fact taking too much of it. This would have been the only inkling at the time Anthony would have had that I had been abusing drugs, as I did try very hard to conceal that from him. Shannon was right, Anthony was very anti-drug, and I knew that, so it made me want to hide that part of me even more. Regardless of how anti-drug he was, later on he still chose to continue to interact with me even after he had discovered I had been abusing much harder drugs. And now we get to this part of the video, the part where I found messages that I believe corroborate my retelling of the night my occurred. Aside from me literally showing you guys my phone, Shannon herself actually confirmed that these messages are real by using them as evidence in her own video. So we know now from both sides that these messages are from Anthony. For anyone who is still skeptical, I'll include a clip of my actual phone scrolling from the very top of the messages where Anthony identifies himself all the way down to the messages we're about to discuss. While I was skimming through old messages between Anthony and I, I stumbled upon a discussion about an illicit video I had sent him. This conversation took place on August 6, 2014. I made a joke about Anthony having a fancy mustache and a glass of wine, and he mentions he doesn't drink. His fervent sobriety and refusal to be around someone who isn't also sober is something that is referenced in the tiny little paragraph dedicated to my rape at the end of the legal letter sent to me by Shannon's lawyer. So Anthony mentioning he doesn't drink does corroborate that belief, but only in a sense. Eight months earlier, in December of 2013, which is actually almost a full year Year after when I originally suspected the rape took place, I tell him that I've been drinking like a fool, and at that point in time, I would have been using heroin or Suboxone. Suboxone is a crutch drug to help people get off of heroin by mimicking its effects in the body while not giving you the addictive sense of intense euphoria. I even mentioned taking Suboxone in that DeviantArt journal that Shannon used in her video as evidence against me. Actually, I said I was prescribed Subutex here. Subutex is just like Suboxone, except it doesn't contain Naloxone. Naloxone being the drug that counteracts the pleasurable effects of an opiate. So users who take Suboxone and attempt to use hair will immediately be put into withdrawal. Subutex is just pure buprenorphine. Buprenorphine being the drug that mimics the effects of opiates within your system without actually getting you high. Except you definitely can still get high. In fact, I even say it kind of gets you dopey in my DeviantArt journal. Not really the words of a sober person. Subutex can be even more dangerous to mix with alcohol because it's just pure buprenorphine. I just wanted to make that clarification. The cardinal rule of being on Suboxone is you do not mix it with alcohol. Every adiknosis can be super dangerous, almost as dangerous as mixing heroin and alcohol. AmericanAddictionCenters.org says alcohol and buprenorphine are central nervous system depressants. Taking them in combination leads to an enhancement of their effects. Side effects that might occur with buprenorphine use can be significantly increased in intensity and number when the drug is used in combination with alcohol. These side effects include issues with nausea, vomiting, and constipation, headache, blurred vision, dizziness, and fainting spells, increased sweating, heart palpitation, increased or decreased blood pressure, and an increased potential of myocardial infarction, decreased motor coordination, poor response times, and extremely impaired thinking processes, including issues with judgment. My first stint of sobriety started in September 2012, but over the course of the next few years afterwards, I would be an on and off user. I would use Suboxone for a couple weeks to keep from going into withdrawal, and I would get up on my high horse and talk about how I was sober, and how my life was so much better sober, and then a few days later, I would stop taking the Suboxone and go pick up. And so I wasn't really sober, but during the course of this time, there were tiny little glints of sobriety, but it obviously wasn't real sobriety. And now as I slowly piece this puzzle back together using messages and medical records and even some evidence from Shannon's own video, I realize now that I would have either been drunk and on heroin or drunk and on Suboxone, and either way, the side effects are intense. It's no wonder I had difficulty piecing this back together at first when I knew in my hardest of hearts, in my 
fucking court that this happened. I tell him that I've been drinking like a fool and that I wasn't drinking because I was trying to party, but because I was trying to escape, meaning escape from reality. From then on, I send him a few incoherent, clearly intoxicated messages complaining about an inappropriate encounter I had with my then boss. I didn't mention it here, probably because I was upset specifically about my boss, but this also would have been right in the middle of Bob and I taking a break from seeing each other. In the messages, I tell Anthony to call me and that's where the conversation ends. I believe that night is when I asked him to come over. Due to all these factors adding up perfectly, I now believe this was probably the night the rape took place. The next conversation we had was initiated by Anthony, who sent me a sexually suggestive message, which I responded to in a sexual manner as well. This conversation took place only five days later, and at that point, I would have just started seeing Bob again. Even though it was a stupidly classic, we were on a break situation, I still felt guilty for having slept with Anthony and embarrassed that I was high and drunk but I also felt guilty because I felt like I had let Anthony on. I didn't want to immediately shut down his sexual advances here because I felt like I had led him to believe we could now engage in a physical relationship again, and I was also afraid of him blowing up at me. So I kind of just slowly segued into talking about how I had started seeing Bob again. And I know there's going to be a very small percentage of people who will lose their mind over this, but this was Anthony's choice. I was very clearly a total train wreck here. So many things were going on in my life, and although he denies ever being around me when I wasn't sober, these messages illustrate that that just isn't true. This man, by his own admission, was sober and sound of mind, and he chose to have sex with me while I was intoxicated and not in the right frame of mind. And Shannon can flap her gums all damn day and say that I'm changing my story, which is such an absurd notion, by the way, mostly because I have always asserted that I know the rape took place, but I do not remember the finer details of how it came to be. Because guess what? I was using drugs. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Heroin and similar opiates can cause you to forget pieces of information, but what it does not do is cause you to hallucinate and invent scenarios. I've had to take a lot of time to read through all of these old messages, not only because there were a lot of them, but also because they were incredibly hard to read. They make me feel sick and sad. All I could see was a girl who thought she had to use her to communicate because that's all she thought she was worth. This was honestly the most traumatic discovery for me because up until now I thought I was just high on heroin, but I was also drunk. That was how low I was at that time, that I didn't care if I live or died. And you know what? Sure, finding these messages gave me more clarity. It corrected the timeline that I was so unsure of before. It put things into perspective, but it didn't make anything better. I still have to live with the knowledge that I was raped, something that for years I blamed myself for. I literally felt sorry for Anthony that he had to have sex with me like that. That is how little I thought of myself. As I read on in these messages, I can even see me like grasping at self-awareness and I just see these little glimmers of hope that I wanted to change and be a better person. And I can see around this time, that's when I started to slowly pull away from Anthony, realizing that he was not a good influence on my life and that I needed to start making better choices. What's really upsetting is that Shannon just continues again and again to weaponize my mental health against me when she had no idea, not a shred of a clue of what I was going through at that moment in time. I just think it's weird she didn't stop and ask herself not even once that maybe something was going wrong in my life for me to act that way. Instead, she uses it as fodder for her video. You can obviously see through those screenshots that I was absolutely floundering at that point in time in my life. Because of my behavior, my my relationship with my family, my friends, romantic partners would constantly fluctuate and go from rosy to pure turmoil overnight. Quote, wrong meds, drug addiction, complex trauma, dismissive doctors, and institutionalization peppered my teenage years. I had several inappropriate encounters with older people, mostly men, but some women, when I was a preteen, and I believe that further fueled this downward spiral and painted a path for what kind of partners I would be drawn to in years to come. Regardless, and I want to make this point very clear, the posts I made as a kid were still wildly inappropriate, and my past was certainly checkered, something I've time and time again acknowledged, both publicly and in my own private therapy sessions throughout the years. 
I have never tried to hide this, and I feel it's very important I'm held accountable for all of it. However, some of the screenshots and claims that Shannon made in her video are wildly misrepresented and are either a complete butchering of what my actual claims were, or screenshots of someone very clearly mimicking, insulting, and at times pretending to be me because, yes, I had made several very shitty, obnoxious, inappropriate, offensive, and quite obviously deeply problematic statements on my own real accounts. But I do caution you about believing that every screenshot came from an account that was actually owned and operated by me. I'm not saying that these accounts were necessarily run by Shannon or Anthony making more obnoxious fodder to expose and harass me in some way at some point in my life. I'm just pointing out that certain accounts seem suspicious and just overall off to me. Shannon herself even points out that the Snacky Packy 9 gag account mimics the tone and subject matter of comments I had made on my personal accounts. And if you look, you'll notice that the troll account really only regurgitates five or so pieces of information that had come from my personal accounts. It's really just a shallow caricature of the shitty person I used to be. And if you actually read what I put in the little meme calling out Snacky Packy, I said, find out someone is impersonating me on 9 gag and is using real information about me from my Facebook. They even use a photograph of me that was publicly available and then the first line and the bio is not a fake account. And before either of our videos came out, I voiced that I thought Shannon had been making fake accounts pretending to be me and bolster my past shittiness in order to expose me at some point in time or use it as leverage. In my original video, I didn't include the Snacky Packy incident or other incidents where I believed Shannon or Anthony were possibly in impersonating my online persona because those instances had the least amount of proof to connect them back to Shannon or Anthony. But now, the fact that Shannon even put the Snacky Packy incident in her video is suspicious to me. And if Shannon really thought the Snacky Packy account was me, why didn't she include it in her list of my aliases? If we're just going by the likes and dislikes on that meme I posted, only 27 people, a very small pool, interacted with it since it was posted, and my ranting and raven 9gag account is isn't attached to any of my other social media. I very briefly used Ranting and Raven as my screen name on YouTube before I ever uploaded any content onto it. So Shannon would have had to have knowledge of that username in order to search for it elsewhere. This is not the first time that Shannon showed a username of mine where I had no idea where she found it. In her document, she includes a list of my aliases, as she calls them, and one of them is Emma Dilemma. And Dilemma is spelled in correctly, which is a DeviantArt page I vaguely remember making, but has since been deleted or removed and cannot be found by searching for it on DeviantArt or on Google. For Christ's sake, I even resorted to using Bing and DuckDuckGo and I could not for the life of me find this DeviantArt account. So that begs the question that if Shannon really only researched all this information after my video came out, how did she get those usernames? And it even begs the question, how did Anthony get those usernames? Because when I search within our messages for either Emma Dilemma or Ranting and Raven, nothing comes up. I just find it weird because having a list of every single alias and username I've ever went by online is something that the Brita Filter account mentioned. It just seems really coincidental, but we'll get back to the Brita account later, I promise. This is all just food for thought. I was just super suspicious about this and wanted to get to the bottom of it. But regardless of all of this, I want to go back to the posts that I actually made and say something about them. For the post that I did make, I'm sorry. They were a perfect example of me being a full-on pick-me girl and shaming other women because I was incredibly self-conscious of my own weight. It fluctuated dramatically at times, and I took it out on women who I was jealous of. It's as simple and petty as that. In Shannon's video, she claimed that I never lost a drastic amount of weight, but then goes on to show a picture of me when I was 165 pounds. Shannon even claimed that I lied about when a certain photo was taken, saying that I claimed I was 15 and in high school when the photo was taken, when in reality it was probably from middle school. And she's seen all of the pictures I posted of myself from 13 onward, and I never looked like that. The cat 
I'm going to show you my senior pictures side by side with what I look like right now. I'm five foot one, almost five foot two, and at my heaviest, I was 160, 165 pounds, and at my absolute lowest, I was 92 pounds. When I say my weight has fluctuated, it has fluctuated. And guess what extreme weight fluctuation is a side effect of? Certain psych meds and drug abuse. Weird. It's just so backwards to me that Shannon accuses me of faking eating disorders, of faking mental illnesses, when clearly in a lot of the posts she's using, I am not well. Not only this, but she had been very outspoken about mental health and eating disorder awareness before. Vice put out a really interesting piece in 2019 talking about how eating disorders often come about because of trauma. If you're currently struggling or in the recovery phase of your eating disorder, I highly recommend watching it. Regardless of Shannon's fucked upness, I have to also sit here and acknowledge my fucked upness at some of the comments I had posted in my early 20s. Something that I just can't stand is when a creator is called out for something and in their apology, they claim they were a different person back then. The things that I posted did not come from a different person. That was still me. I have done a lot of work to scrutinize and analyze my past actions and to try and grow and change from them. And the work isn't over. It will never be over. I'm okay being confronted with these truths because I need to see them and I need to be reminded of them to continue to make better choices, not only for myself, but for my children and the people who I surround myself with. I've struggled with my mental health and drug addiction to many different substances over the years. And because of this, I was, not surprisingly, vulnerable. I was around many toxic people, some serious criminals, some just people who wanted to take advantage of that vulnerability. I had no idea how to draw a boundary, so I let anyone who would pay me any mind into my life. Any accusations of abuse I've made in the past are not limited to only violent or sexual abuse, but also emotional abuse. It is not at all uncommon for someone in such a vulnerable position as drug addiction to be taken advantage of many times over by multiple people, especially because I had many partners from the time that I was young. Though I must point out that Shannon's claims of who I did and did not call abusive were flat out wrong and another example of her drawing conclusions by by filling in the blank. A teenage Emily over-dramatizing a long-standing tiff with another person does not an accusation of serious abuse make. There were times I didn't get along with someone and made the very common mistake of just saying thing bad instead of really looking into the nuance of the relationship. This does not equal a formal accusation of abuse. So Shannon, let me fix your little infographic really quickly. There. That's better. Also, when I speak about relationships in past videos, I chose to ignore certain relationships and privately regard them as not counting because of the state of my life at the time that I was in them. At several points, Shannon tries to connect random people that I've dated to specific old story time videos and paints that as a 100% fact and as me formally accusing all of these people of abuse. Not one of her assumptions is correct, specifically because of my habit for switching details around for identity protection. But I'll get to that in a moment. I also don't accuse a bunch of random people of serious abuse in all of those videos. This is just another example of Shannon's hoping you won't go back and check. The storytime videos I made about certain relationships were mostly for entertainment, and although the stories were real, many identifying facts and information had to be changed or switched around between other story times, something that Shannon even points out in her video. I didn't want to ever fabricate stories, so instead I would take real details and rearrange them, sometimes between in completely different situations. I did this for multiple reasons. To make certain stories have an actual resolution because a good number of them didn't, for the protection of the people within the stories or, in the specific cases Shannon highlighted, the protection of myself. That being said, some of my past story times were actually about me. I would deliberately switch the roles around, change the details, and retell the story with me as the protagonist instead of the clumsy, embarrassing drug addict or drunk. This was not something I did on just that one video. What a coincidence. This was actually something I did a few times, which like I said before is something Shannon even pointed out. These videos are noticeably different from my other videos because one, I am needlessly cruel to the quote antagonist of the video and they are clearly painted out to be the bad guy. And two, the videos are a lot more detached from emotion 
mocking even. I probably would have made more videos like that had I not been in therapy. I learned I did this as an unhealthy form of self-punishment as I would often mock the quote antagonist in these stories. These stories, really these situations that I was in have haunted my nightmares. I felt guilt, pain, shame, embarrassment, and intense anxiety over them. I felt like I was keeping a secret, like I needed to be shamed for what had happened to me. So I wrote them into a script. I unloaded them. I completely detached from them. I compartmentalized them. I put them into a box. Basically, I just pretended like they weren't mine. They didn't happen to me. As Shannon has highlighted, I used to be a chronic overshare, which is oddly in stark contrast to who I am now. Maybe I have Shannon to thank for that. The stories were very much real at their core, but the roles were also very much reversed. I want to briefly touch on a clip that Shannon presented in her video. It was a clip of me discussing a relationship I had when I was 13 with someone when they were 17. In this specific story time, I used the control reversing tactics I had discussed earlier, so I was discussing it as if I were the older party. What Shannon failed to include is this clip earlier in that same video. So that's why I feel that a 13-year-old who was just about to turn 14 and a 17-year-old who had just turned 17 isn't that big of a deal. You're all essentially still being taken care of by your parents and you're still relatively at the same maturity level. I still have a lot of complicated feelings about this person that I was discussing in that video. And I feel like, yes, the relationship was still inappropriate, but that was more because of other power dynamic reasons that I won't go into. And I absolutely don't condone anything of the sort. But my general feelings around this person are complicated. But this person was not and is still not a terrible person, and we still get along to this day. I just really wanted to clarify that this person and I are much closer in age than originally portrayed in my video. It was a running joke among our mutuals at the time because the age gap at first glance seemed a lot larger than it actually was. This person obviously realizes that the relationship was inappropriate in nature and has since owned up to it. We've discussed it, and I don't hold any ill will against this person. If anything, I still feel embarrassed about how that interaction went down. I still really don't know how to feel about all of it. I know this person is anonymous, but still something within me felt that needed clarifying because I do still care about this person. And regardless of what Twitter trolls will tell you, it can be 10, 15, 20, 50 years since your trauma. If you still don't know how to feel about it, that is your fucking business. And anyone who tells you, well, it's been this amount of time, so you should know how to feel about it by now can suck a nut. I want to be clear that not every old story time on my channel is a role reversed butchered mess of details. In fact, I don't think there are many left on my channel at all. As I did more work in therapy, I started to run out of stories that I felt comfortable sharing and my life ultimately became pretty mundane, so I produced less and less story time content. These old videos, specifically the ones where I was a minor, were inappropriate and the way I portrayed certain roles were dishonest and I apologize for any harm they may have caused to anyone. It was a very backwards way of trying to deal with a complex trauma, trying to turn a tragedy into a comedy, and it was misguided to say the absolute least. I just want you all to know that I realize this now. I've since learned to take the slightly less interesting parts of my life, parts where I had to persevere or make a big decision about my art career, and I've used those to share and reflect on important lessons I've learned. Some other things that were troubling about Shannon's video is that she decided to simply fill in the blanks of my life and act as if she had some secret insight into it because she matched up some pictures with the same wallpaper or a pillow or whatever. It was a deranged attempt to frame certain aspects of my life, again, my life, as if they had never happened. I want to touch on some of what Shannon claimed about my relationship with my father and about my living situation. My father and I had a difficult relationship during my active addiction. There were many times he would tell me that I wasn't allowed back into his home if I was using, but then renege on that weeks or sometimes even days later out of concern for me. This is absolutely commonplace among parents who are struggling with a child in active addiction, and I don't blame him for what he felt he had to do back then. You were also there when 
I things were starting to perk up and I got that job at the optometry place and then oh, I was wow. fired. You you were there. You you no, I think you were the first no. person I called. It was like and I said this before you, you I swear to god you couldn't get a break. A little bit of hope. You just a tiny bit. You got the job. We were so happy for you and not 2 weeks later uh, yeah, you got fired. And I was overwhelmed with rage because I was like, what happened? What happened? Just, I, I didn't know. And you told me that your stalker who uh, you had told me that you had a stalker, like, I think before we'd met, but it was sort of unclear and it was sort of an on and off thing. I that... had the stalker before we met, but I told you about it when we had met. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't like you were hiding, hiding it. It was just something like, Hey, there's a person you should be aware of. I don't know who it is. Someone contacted them saying they were a customer and brought and sent them from what I remember at the time had sent them the, the video. Um, it had nothing to do with the cami. It was, it was that video. And they said, okay, well, we don't really want to sift through this uh, because I think you'd probably contended that it wasn't actually a customer, that it was your soccer, but they're like, well, we don't want any drama. So yep. um, thank you. Goodbye. Which it's is like, fair. You know, I understand it, why yeah, it was so disheartening for I think all of us, because we, you know, we were excited about it. You were rooting for me. I was doing well. And and then it was gone. It was just there. And then it was gone. It still to this day makes me so mad. And after I was fired, then uh, Bob and his mom let me move into their home. It was gradual at first at some, some point between me slowly moving things from my van into Bob's home. My dad, again, reneged, which I've discussed um, earlier in the video. I would have discussed early in the video. My dad reneged on kicking me out because I think at that point it was because I just I didn't have a job or, or something like that. Our relationship was constantly in flux. So and again, like I had been homeless before. Yeah, I even met Bob. So uh, it's not like there's this one time I was homeless for a week. Shannon even has a picture of me having like a pillow on Bob's bed, (laughs) like proving that I was, I had a pillow on his bed, like having a place to sleep that was safe. The point is that you witnessed um, me being fired. You were there for it. You were the first person I called. And then you were the first person to send out a lifeline and help me after that happened. Your your housing situation had sort of been in flux. You didn't really know where you're at. If he was one day going to decide you could live there, one day it wasn't going to be super certain. Um, But you have to realize that when you exist in that seedy underbelly and you're commingling with people who are criminals, some really unexpected wild things happen, some really traumatic things happen. And so it's hard to be pulled out of that. So I was very fortunate to have a consistent lifeline from Bob and his family that never gave up on me. And I I do attribute, you know, I know I did a lot of the work, but I think without that lifeline, I don't know where I'd be. You try to paint me as lying about my addiction, about my homelessness, my own pain, using these small fragments of my past social media post, never once considering that I was possibly only posting the few rosy, positive things that were in my life at the time, possibly to distract from the otherwise dark and uncomfortable parts. Just because at times I could be a chronic overshare about certain things doesn't mean I couldn't also hide other things, things I felt more personal shame over. And sure, you could use the fact that I was also hiding a lot of things from my social media as a way to paint me as an unreliable narrator, which you actually do several times within your video. But then that makes the majority of your evidence useless. Which is it? Am I an unreliable narrator who frequently lies or am I someone to be taken at face value? Or I guess social media post value? Obviously, there will always be nuance to a question like that, but in a video like yours, Shannon, which, let's be real, is a total hit piece, it has to either be black or white in order to prove your point. You can't use one piece of evidence, say that I'm lying, but then use that same piece of evidence later as a way to confirm where I was or what I was doing or what have you. That doesn't make sense. 
there are several instances where Shannon just completely fabricates evidence but puts screenshots up on the screen as if they directly corroborate what she had just said. An example of this is her smoking gun evidence from a post I made on my Instagram several years ago. She claims that my real sobriety date was in November 2012 and uses the lyrics from a song I wrote, sang, and posted in September 2016, specifically about my relationship with Hawen as confirmation of that date. The lyrics are three years in November, and she says that's for the proof that my sobriety date was in November of 2012, except November 2016 minus three would be November 2013. She also did this using a clip from my I Dated a Sociopath video, which I uploaded in May of 2016. Did did Shannon not know math? I think it's much more likely that she knew her math was incorrect. She was just hoping that no one would go back and fact check her on it. This is just yet another example of her throwing screenshots up on the screen and claiming one thing when the screenshots actually show something completely different. Not only that, but here's a court summons I received about a drug DUI I was charged with, showing the offense date as 12-8-12. With this evidence, it's obvious I was still using after the date that Shannon claimed. I was even using at the beginning of my relationship with Bob, which was in June of 2013. But you absolutely 100% have witnessed me picking up drugs, using drugs, um, yeah. not limited to just uh, heroin. It was, it was awful. It was really difficult. I mean, to this day, I think about it because it, it was hard, especially in the very beginning and seeing you. I mean, I didn't even know about the nodding thing before I saw it in person. So I was never super comfortable and it it was awful. Yes, I was there for for the hair news. I'll be the first to admit I often was vague about my sobriety date or more often than not just flat out didn't update it. I had different sober birthdays for different drugs and over time they all kind of just blended together. A lot of addicts will have a sober birthday for their DOC or drug of choice but also a sober birthday for all other substances. This is not an uncommon thing to happen. In fact most addicts relapse during the recovery process and hate to break it to you Shannon, don't always run to social media to share. One other piece of evidence she used to try and disprove the rape ever occurred was that I had a good relationship with Anthony and Brandon for years after the breakup, which is something I even pointed out in my original video. This was because after the dust had settled post-breakup, Anthony, Brandon, and I reconnected, apologized, and became friends again. I was completely ignorant to how deeply unhealthy our original relationship was. I just thought it was super dramatic, and I continued working with both Anthony and Brandon as evidenced by the songs and videos I posted in my original video. Once I got into therapy, I learned two very important things. One, the relationship I had with Anthony was unhealthy. And two, the sexual encounter was a rape because and only because I was intoxicated when it happened. In the PDF letter that their lawyer sent me, Anthony even admits to a sexual encounter occurring after our breakup. I believe he did this because there is evidence of us planning meetups and speaking sexually with one another long after our breakup. That way, if it ever went to court and I came forward with all of these messages, Anthony could say that he openly admitted to having a sexual encounter with me. I never changed my story. I made clarifications. Anyone can go back and fact check that. As I retold the events to my therapist, I even remember framing it as an embarrassing mistake I had made, only to be corrected and told that it was a Hence why I blocked Anthony out of nowhere, which is something Shannon even acknowledged he was confused about in her video. Anthony lightly trolled her in order to figure out why she blocked him on Instagram at the beginning of 2017, because they had been on good terms the last time they spoke, as seen in her post tagging him. He wanted to know what happened. He states as much in his message. Emily also asks if he's the person harassing her, to which he replies no, because if he's going to say something, even something mean, it's going to have his name and his photo next to it, like he had just done, in the messages that were clearly joking in nature. I didn't write any of Anthony's messages to her, this was all him. For her to say it's me is a lie. That is quite literally the entire section. That tiny little clip that I just showed is all of the time that she dedicated to this accusation. And to refresh your memory about what this accusation was, I made a tweet saying one of my videos was going viral because at the time 200,000 views was a ton of views. And then I went in and corrected it and said that I was going mini viral. And then Anthony, who I had blocked on a different platform, started following me solely to accuse me of buying views. He was blocked on a different platform, and he was obviously not following me on Twitter with his main account beforehand, so that led me to believe that he was monitoring my social media. So after he posted his two vitriolic tweets, I blocked him. And not moments 
Later did I receive a message from a sock puppet account that was literally named not viral underscore Emily accusing me of the exact same fucking thing, even coming in clutch with some screenshots, which proved absolutely nothing. I had to use Twitter data in combination with old screenshots in order to piece back exactly what was said because Anthony has since deleted his Twitter account. And when I confronted him, I said this. My husband doesn't like me being in touch with my exes that I wasn't in touch with when we met, i.e. basically every one of them. That is why I keep blocking you. I know you're the one who has been harassing me all this time. Just please take care of yourself. This is not healthy. I'm not trying to be cold. I'm just being honest. And I don't know if he responded to that first message or I just decided to follow up about 30 minutes later because he wasn't responding, but I don't have a screenshot of a message in between the first and second message. And the message I do have a screenshot of seems like he is responding to both the first and second message here. The second message says, I'm sorry. I didn't think you'd care because we didn't really talk anymore. I didn't realize you hold so much hostility towards me. I don't for you. What's so sad is I still played your music for people all the way up until I realized it was you. Like, even though we stopped talking, I still supported your music. I don't know why you're so angry at me and why you've tried to fuck up everything for me. I don't know why you just won't leave it alone. And then I follow up with, we loved each other once and I don't know why we can't just respect that love, be civil, and go our separate ways. And in response to that, he said this. Anthony responds, harassing? No, I've only posted in what my accounts are, like what has my face on it. And I'm not angry. I was just curious. I figured maybe if I get more ridiculous, I get a response. I wanted to see where your stuff went, which is why I was bummed you blocked me. But no, I'm not angry at all. Thank you for the reason though. Much appreciated. Good luck out there. Why would he and Shannon bring up that he only posts things, no matter how nasty, through his personal accounts, accounts that have his face attached to them? Because if he's going to say something, even something mean, it's going to have his name and his photo next to it. When I made no mention of accounts or sock accounts or harassment or anything of the sort, why would he feel the need to defend himself against an accusation I never made? In fact, I didn't even bring up sock accounts until after he did. Speaking of defending oneself against an imaginary accusation, Shannon made sure to include this at the end of the section. I didn't write any of Anthony's messages to her. This was all him. For her to say it's me is a lie. I never made that accusation. I do remember multiple viewers saying that some of the messages from Anthony sound like Shannon, but I personally never made that direct accusation. And I went looking for evidence of me making this accusation, and I couldn't find anything. Aside from that, this is yet another example of Shannon completely glossing over a piece of very important and pretty damning evidence. As for Brandon, who I'm still going to call Brandon because I feel he's very much still in the dark here and I don't want to draw attention to his real name, Shannon was the one who accused Brandon of not only stalking the both of us, but also getting her fired from a job as well as messaging her followers and calling her obscenities. Shannon was the one who chose to message me out of the blue on Twitter one day and warn me that Brandon Brandon was trying to hack into her social media. She just conveniently glossed over all of that in her response video, acting as if it were me attacking Brandon, even though I proved that those screenshots were legitimate and all came from her account. I called Brandon intense in my original video, but that was because he could be intense sometimes. Shannon paints me saying this as being ableist, but I had no idea that Brandon was autistic. Brandon even used the term untreated to describe his autism at the time. Given that at the time I was a 90 pound untreated autistic man. Now obviously you can't treat autism. You are either on the spectrum or you are not. So that leads me to believe that he meant undiagnosed. I don't even think Brandon knew he had autism at the time we knew each other. So if he didn't know, how on earth was I supposed to know? To myself and a lot of others, all of this just proves the intensity in which Shannon was monitoring my life. Meticulously archiving and screenshotting every post, every contradiction, every nasty thing I did. The part that gets me is that when I showed clear improvement, growth, and development as a person, when I was becoming healthier and more self-aware, that 
is when she chose to come down on me the hardest. When I showed compassion to others, when I made friends, had healthy, functional relationships, that is when she chose to torment me the most. When things were starting to get back on track for me is when her targeted harassment was at its worst, as if bettering myself was what made her angry and not necessarily my problematic past actions. She does a whole lot of talking about how she doesn't know me and how she doesn't care in her video, all while stuffing every tiny, insignificant detail about my life that has nothing to do with the general points she wanted to make. She does a lot of talking about how she would never take the cookie from the cookie jar, all while she has crumbs around her mouth and chocolate on her fingers. We didn't see her take and eat the cookie, and yes, the crumbs and chocolate could be from something else, but the timing, the evidence, the literal crumbs all point in one direction. It's circumstantial, but it's very damning. Also, just because I made other accusations of stalking doesn't mean that those were separate instances of stalking, as I now know the majority of those past stalking incidents were more than likely coming from one source, not the other sources like I had suspected in the past. And to be very clear, I had never directly accused any one person in the past. I had made vague and anonymous accusations because I was unsure of where the harassment was coming from. In my original video, I clearly stated that I had no idea who was stalking me until the last few years. What should matter is that I consistently complained about being stalked and feeling uncomfortable, proving that I had been concerned about this for years. This is just one of many examples where Shannon twists what I said in either my video or in my past to disprove a point that I never actually made. I even said in my original video that yes, I had experienced some online harassment before, but it was much more generic and mild opposed to the more targeted, obsessive, and vindictive stalking that we're talking about here. An occasional comment about me being a butt sl is not the same thing as sending me lol cow and deviantart screenshots or bringing up very specific parts about my life. That kind of targeted harassment pretty much completely stopped after I confronted Shannon and oddly enough around that same time is when Shannon started posting on lol cow. I also want to go on record and say that I never accused my ex Bob of forcing me to cam. He's a very good friend of mine and even he can tell you I had many close interactions with less than stellar individuals, some of whom believed I owed them something for my time working with them. I don't feel comfortable discussing that part of my life, and I don't feel I should have to. I think just saying what I said paints enough of a picture in and of itself. Just because I was living with someone good and kind while this happened doesn't mean I wasn't still unsafe in other aspects. I want to come full circle, and I want Bob to go ahead and I've already adamantly said that Bob did not at all in any way, shape, or form force me to do anything that I didn't want to do, ever. It's hard to convey that, right? That I, I don't, I can't, I'm not going to force anyone to do something like that. I, I wanted you to be employed, but I didn't, I, you know, and I knew it was a difficult time for money, but I can't, I mean, it it does hurt me that that is sort of the accusation or that was the the lens that it was seen through at least by Shannon. You you did so much for, so for her to accuse me of like claiming that you did, that, that's what's so insulting and frustrating. What's even more insulting is she goes so far to be like, well, you know, this couldn't be true because look, and then shows a picture of you holding my newborn, my two month old baby. That doesn't prove anything. Obviously it didn't. I'm saying it, Bob is saying it, it's, you know, a disgusting and egregious accusation, but we, that's something we just want to clarify because you are a, an innocent, you're a victim in all of this. You never accused me of that either. And no. I don't think, you know, if you compile every word that everyone, that someone says, I'm sure, I'm sure you can find a way to use it against them, especially when it's taken out of context. And that's what yep. I think a lot of the information is. I mean, when you force a situation, when you've tried your best to fill in the holes, if you've been following someone adamantly for years, but can't see the parts that are not, that you're not privy to, then you can write a conclusion, you can write any conclusion that you want and somehow justify it. The fact that Shannon came to this and many other conclusions just shows me that she knows absolutely nothing about how drug addiction and sex trafficking work. Just because I didn't post about every relapse and every criminal offense online does not negate their very existence. Same goes for when I would use hyperbole to describe one situation or another. This would not negate other bad things or relationships that would have happened to me, especially when Shannon would take certain 
certain parts wildly out of context, which she did often in her video. Just more examples of her purposefully twisting the original allegations to fit her own narrative that she can then disprove. She knows most people won't go back and check, as she so lovingly pointed out in her description, so she went ahead and moved the chess pieces when our backs were turned for six months, hoping no one would have the give a shit to go back and check my actual verbiage. Again, all this video further proves to me is that Shannon has done far more than just some extensive research. Most of this evidence likely comes from years and years of monitoring, scrutinizing, and obsessing. She even tried to set up a paper tiger argument in the unedited version of her Google Doc where she says that if I try to say that her having all this information about me is stalking, then I'm just playing the victim. That she was just trying to clear her name and she did extensive research in order to do so. Because look, this is all still publicly available. Well, except for this, and except for this. Well, okay, except for this. But she had a DeviantArt when she was 13 that she posted hypersexual cringe content on. A huge portion of Google Doc is just her trying to cover her bases by setting up a ton of these paper tiger arguments. Like if Emily claims these accounts aren't her, she's lying. Or if I was really stalking Emily, I would have made an exposed video on her by now. There's just so much defensiveness in her document. Defensiveness that I feel wouldn't be necessary if you were really innocent. In fact, a common tell for people who are guilty of an offense is that they immediately start to explain why it couldn't have been them opposed to vehemently denying it right out. Shannon deploys this it couldn't have been me, see, tactic not only throughout her video but also after I first accused her of stalking me. However, the way she denies them is that of a guilty person trying to act innocent. Her, re her behavior in the conversation is very incriminating from a criminal psychology standpoint. The fact that Shannon attempts to solidify her innocence so hard by writing mounds of paragraphs as to why it couldn't possibly be her, and giving countless reasons as to why there's no way we do that to you, and then going off on tangents about her stalker, Creepshow's responses are long-winded, drawn-out, explanatory. Something the guilty does when placed in an interrogation room by the police. Guilty people will seek approval from interrogators in order to feel like they're not being seen as suspicious and in order to seek that approval. In order to do that, they will continuously say things and give details that are not entirely necessary. They will talk about things that really don't mean anything. Another action I find unusual is how, in Shannon's unedited Google Doc, she goes into great detail about a very small, specific account that was re-uploading the audio of my old videos. She talks about how she knew this account existed before, and because she's such a good person, she tried reporting this account several times. Oddly enough, this exact same account is actually linked in one of her suspected lol cow posts, and this was the account that multiple sock puppets were trying to get me to notice. This is almost Almost as strange as the fact that every detail Shannon chose to fixate on in her video is almost exactly all the same stuff that the Brita Filter account claimed that their 15-year-old brother was fixated on, like the bathtub video and accusing me of buying subscribers, and that they were actually the ones that got me fired from the optical shop. And let's not forget that Brita Filter even mentioned a video that I had only ever sent to Anthony, and they have a list of pretty much every screen name I've ever had. You know, the gang's all here, really. I realize that two people can have the same information, but really, what is the likelihood of two people conveniently having every last detail of every screen name, post, and account I've ever had online, deleted, public, or otherwise? What is the likelihood of this young child getting their hands on a video that I only sent to one person, and the unlisted link that I sent to Anthony came from an account that's never been hacked? In fact, all of the views on that unlisted video come from the same link. Again, think back to the cookie jar. Something that's also interesting to note is that her whole diatribe on my previous anime YouTube channel was also something that was mentioned in the lol cow posts, trying to force people down that quote, rabbit hole, so to speak. Not only that, but a similar timeline of her perception of my drug addiction is also present in the lol cow posts. There was also an oddly specific post about a private interaction between Shannon and I, an interaction I had told absolutely no one about. The post accuses me of going around and telling small 
smaller channels that they aren't allowed to do story time videos because that's my brand. When in reality, back when both Shannon and I were very small channels, she had copied the exact name of my series, Sketchbook Storytime, and started passing it off as her own. I sent her a very polite DM asking if she could possibly change the name of her series because I had come up with it for my channel. This targeted harassment on LawCow is identical to the kind of targeted, let's dig into this woman's past and mock her for it kind of harassment I had started to receive all those years ago. This goes so much deeper than just your generic trolling. All of this wildly coincidental information just further proves to me that the LawCow leaks were most likely authentic. Shannon claims that the Brita Filter account not only reached out to her with all this information on me, but also to Hopeless Peaches, which Peaches herself outright said was a complete lie. In the conversation I had with Shannon in 2018, she claimed that the Brita account was a malicious stalker, even though Brita was supposed to be a throwaway account made by the stalker's sibling, which is another bizarre inconsistency. She also claimed that they had deleted their account, which we know not to be true. In order for what Shannon has said to be true, the 15-year-old stalker would have also had to have an account called Brita Filter. They would have had to message Shannon on that account, then delete their account. Then afterwards, the sibling would have stumbled across all the evidence of stalking, and then they would create a burner account, also naming it Brita Filter, and then they reached out to me. Which doesn't make sense to me, because if I were the older sibling in this situation, and I saw that my younger sibling was harassing someone by the name of Brita Filter, I wouldn't think to then name my burner account, the account that I'm going to use to reach out to this person, Brita Filter. I feel for like a lot of Shannon's story and her defense, you really have to suspend your disbelief for all of these inconsistencies and coincidences and the things that do make a little bit of sense she's being dishonest about. An even more frustrating example of this, where Shannon not only twists something that I said to fit her narrative, but she's also using Anthony's word as gospel truth to disprove something that, again, I never actually said. Shannon quotes me as saying that I was close with Anthony's step-grandma, and that I said we had bonded over the course of Anthony and I's relationship, and then throws a screenshot up on the screen and keeps it pushing. She then says that Anthony's grandfather was actually dating someone completely different when Anthony and I were together and that I never met Anthony's step-grandmother, that I'm just completely fabricating this ultra-close relationship. She then goes on to imply that I faked the screenshot of the message I had sent to Anthony's step-grandmother, alerting her to the harassment all those years ago because they asked her and she said she had received no such message. She also said that I must have been lying because Anthony's step-grandmother did not have a Facebook at the time. But then she confirms that the message might have been real by saying, Emily took it upon herself to send them what she thought was personal, private information of his in order to hurt him. I have no idea how Shannon gathered the confidence, the gall, the balls to post this when all of it is completely made up. And not only that, but you just have to go back and watch my video to see that it's completely made up. The only part of it that was true was yes, Anthony's grandfather did not get with this woman until after Anthony and I had broken up. But I never stated anything to the contrary. Remember, Anthony and I had a friends with benefits relationship long after we broke up. So I was in his life when his grandfather was seeing this woman. I was in his life when they moved into her home. I was in that house on multiple occasions. I spoke to her on multiple occasions. I even spoke to her brother, whose room was situated right next to Anthony's on multiple occasions. Shannon, I ask you this. How would I have been able to record those two songs, Autumn's Moment and Stardust, with Anthony in his little recording booth, which was located in the closet of his room in this woman's house, without having been to the house? or without having met this woman. Because as you know, Shannon, she was really strict, and she didn't let anyone into her house that she did not know. And I was never close with this woman. I literally never said that. What I did say was I was trying to get Anthony to give her a chance and that I got along with her. Just saying you get along with someone is pretty far off from saying that you bonded and were close with someone. This was who his grandfather was going to marry. And although she was strict, she seemed nice enough. And I didn't understand all the vitriol against her. And as for the message I sent her, Facebook does this thing, right? Where 
if you are not friends with someone and you send them a message, your message goes into their message request inbox. And I'd be willing to argue that most casual Facebook users don't even know this inbox exists. And then that bit about me sending personal private information in order to hurt him, if you actually stop and read the message I sent to her, you would see no such thing. In fact, I am giving her personal private information of mine in order to try and get in touch with her so I could have filed a restraining order. And the only information I included about him at all was the fact that he was thinking thinking about changing his last name from his original last name to Parker, which was his public Facebook name. I remember he spoke of changing his surname from to Parker, but I'm not sure if he ever went through with that. Feel free to call me. My phone number is blank and I currently live in Nebraska. I moved hoping a fresh start in a new state would deter his aggression, but it doesn't seem to have done any good. Thank you, Emily. And because his step-grandma and I weren't friends on Facebook, I believe she never saw this message. In Shannon's video, something bizarre that stuck out to me is this interaction Shannon had with Anthony about some review she left for Bob's place of work. Anthony completely and utterly fabricates the entire story all about how I had a tantrum that she even went into Bob's place of business. Shannon shows the conversation between her and Anthony and speaks as if that's enough evidence that the tantrum took place which is another example of her taking what Anthony says as the gospel truth. Bob is actually the social media manager for the shop and always has been. And although he doesn't remember the review and he can't seem to find the original review, he can still confirm its authenticity and that Shannon actually physically went into the shop itself because she mentions a specific part-time employee of the shop by name. And this part-time employee was never featured on the company's website. I know we're being really serious right now, but fucking Osa came in here and straight up farted. And now you're leaving. Walk away. Wow. She just she just came down the steps, came over here. And then I just hear go and fart. And then she, she didn't even sit down. She wow. just ripped ass and left. And you never found the review Shannon claimed she left, right? No, I assume it was because she said, you know, she deleted her Facebook. I, I mean, she definitely went there. Like, I know she came to my place of work, for sure, because she gave the name of one of the employees who I don't think was even on the website. I recommended yeah. Anthony yeah. specifically because Anthony Anthony wanted to capture the sound of a violin bow on a guitar. He thought that was a really interesting sound. And I, and I had been suggesting, like, you know, go to you know, Bob's place of work. He he works at this place. Because I was on good terms with Anthony at that point, I hadn't realized what had happened between us was not, you know, my fault. I thought like a melding of the minds would be good because I was, you know, dating Bob, who is an amazing, you know, musician. Um, and, and I felt that Anthony was also an amazing musician. I'd wanted them to meet on multiple occasions. And I, so I'd recommended on multiple occasions that Anthony go to your job to get this bow. Um, because the only way this could be true, they lived on the like complete opposite side of, um, of the Bay area, like complete opposite where Bob's job is. It was a very long drive. So it's not like, why would they go there for any other reason than I had recommended them? So it makes absolutely no sense that Shannon would leave this positive review and I'd throw this tantrum over her leaving a positive review when I had recommended that they go there. And you remember, you remember me talking about, asked like, about it. Yeah, because, you know, obviously it's like a shameless plug for the boyfriend. And I was like, oh yeah, I work at a, at a violin shop. And you're like, oh my God, this is perfect. It made sense. And I remember you were enthusiastic and it was a lot, it was a ways for them to come though. Cause when Shannon, Shannon was portraying that like she randomly went into this shop and left a good review. And I found out, how would I have found out about the review? That's what, and it was a positive review. Yeah. And, and, and why would I have this big meltdown over a positive review? Again, they could have gone to any number of other music shops in San Jose. Cause they're just, they were just looking There's for a bow. Very prominent music shops that are much closer to them. Like, yeah, it would make no sense that they would go there had it not been for my recommendation. Shannon doesn't go on to show any proof of this meltdown. She only shows the like Facebook messages of her and Anthony talking about it. And that happens a few times where she uses Anthony's messages as like proof 
like of of me doing something. Another and final example of Shannon taking Anthony's word as the gospel truth is found here on this little section she dedicated to Anthony and I's breakup. Anthony did not try to break up with me on more than one occasion with all his friends watching. We definitely had one or two disagreements when his friends were present, but those disagreements did not end in us breaking up. Anthony only broke up with me the one time and it completely blindsided me. I was sitting down playing piano, Brandon called me, started yelling at me, threatening me and calling me names. And then when I begged to speak to Anthony, he said I was no longer allowed to speak to him. And then he hung up on me. And that was quite literally it. I was so blindsided. I was so confused. I had to dig through the recesses of my brain to figure out why all of a sudden was he breaking up with me. Now, logically, I can look back and fully agree with the real reason that Anthony broke up with me, which was probably because our relationship was so unstable and we didn't treat each other well. But at the time, the conclusion I came to was that I posted a flirty comment on an openly gay friend's Facebook page because the call came like moments after I had posted that comment. And during the phone call, Brandon had made several comments about me being unfaithful and slutty. What most likely happened is that Anthony was just using that comment as a way to break up with me when his real reason was that we just did not have a healthy relationship. And the day after the phone call, because I was so blindsided and confused, I did go to Anthony's work, which I admitted in my original video. Shannon says that I was escorted off the premises, but that just didn't happen. I went up, I asked Anthony's manager if he was there that day, he said no, and I left. Nobody escorted me off the premises. Shannon also cites an incident where I apparently passed out behind the movie theater. I think I recall what she was talking about, but I didn't pass out. I remember sitting on the curb and crying because Anthony and I had gotten into a heated argument. My knees were tucked up against my chest, open, and my head was between them, but I don't ever remember lying on the floor. In her unedited document, Shannon goes on to list a bunch of names of Anthony's friends that apparently witnessed me passing out all the time and Anthony and I breaking up all the time. And she then said they would testify against me in court. But one of the friends she listed is actually one of the friends that I reached out to when I was trying to get a restraining order against Anthony. And then this over here is to a mutual friend of ours. <clears throat> and I asked the exact same thing. You know, I say... Hey friend, I know it's random for me to reach out, but this is very important. I don't know how much contact you have with Anthony, but I need help with filing a restraining order against him. You know, our friend responds, um, and I don't want to invade his privacy. He basically just said, like, I, I barely know him. All I know is, like, he moved to Oregon and is living out of his car. Um, and I'm so sorry this is happening to you. Our friend was really kind and, and nice. It said he believes that men should be held accountable for their shitty actions. So... Um, I sent our friend this, um, July 26, 2018. And this person is still my friend on Facebook, even after I sent him that message. So if he really thinks I'm crazy and is going to testify against me in court, don't you think he would have just ignored that message or at the very least unadded me from Facebook? Shannon even goes on to say that she has... I don't know, meaning maybe they interviewed multiple eyewitnesses to my erratic behavior, including former coworkers, bosses, and mutual friends. I'm sorry, but I have a really hard time believing any of that, mostly because I don't know what eyewitnesses she would even be talking about. I've never had any kind of meltdown at any job I've ever had. And aside from that one instance that Brandon had referenced where I had the black pain on me, I don't recall any other significant mental breakdown that had a bunch of eyewitnesses. The vast majority of Anthony and I's disagreements were in private, and the only other big blow-up that Anthony and I would have had actually happened in the parking lot of a Denny's, and it was just Anthony and I. I genuinely believe that Shannon has absolutely no eyewitnesses. She is just completely fabricating that to try and intimidate me. And the reason I think this is because she knows I have multiple people who have witnessed her behavior and are willing to testify against her in court, if it ever came down to it. So she wants to feel like she has some big trump card, so she says she has all these eyewitnesses. 
I also think she's creating stories based off of things that I posted online and other real life things that happened between Anthony and I. Like the one time I did show up to Bryce's house unannounced was when I had the black paint on me. But it was completely unrelated to the breakup. I was just having a mental breakdown because I took too many drugs. She also just casually mentions that apparently I sexually harassed a bunch of women when Anthony and I were together and that she contacted these apparent victims. I think she's making up this story because she has that clip of me talking about my age gap relationship, so it makes it more believable that I could have sexually harassed women, especially if you have no idea about the real context behind the video. Not only did I not sexually harass anyone, but let alone any women because I was a jealous bitch. We didn't hang out with any women. Are you fucking kidding me, Shannon? You can't have eyewitnesses to something that never fucking happened. She just drops that accusation and just moves on. That's a serious ass allegation and she said no more about it. Hey, it was way more important that she got back to the DeviantArt journals from when I was 13. Oh, and analyzing the colors of the walls in my childhood home. That stuff is important. And not only is she assuming that because I had these dramatic text meltdowns in a DeviantArt journal when I was 13 that that must mean I always have meltdowns in real life. But she's also assuming that if that were the case that that's going to help her at all in court. You also have to keep in mind that with the DeviantArt journals, as a child, I don't think I fully understood the meaning of them being public. I just figured since I was a small account and hardly had anyone following me that I could treat the journals like a diary and only the people who were very close to me would ever be allowed to see it. I could get all of my emotions out and kind of streamline them and process them and make better decisions in real life. Which is funny because Shannon doesn't choose to show those journal entries. When I was 13, the internet was very different from today. We didn't have this overall understanding that the internet was forever yet. So it makes it so much worse that Shannon is trying to paint a picture of me using these journals, as well as the fragmented pieces of Anthony and I's broken relationship. None of that is recent, so how is this supposed to help you in court? What is this going to do for you now? Now, bitch. Like, what is the argument here? You are losing me. And trust me, I am not the only person that Shannon has lied about. Far from it. Did you Tipster see the way that she tried to rip hat. Tipster a new asshole? And what's with her accusing all of her friends of crying on stream because she's such an amazing friend? And it might seem funny on the surface, be and, and you know, like some of, some of it is funny. Brain. But she really over her friends and then bailed on them and then turned around and pointed the finger at them like they were the ones not being loyal. A person who does kind things is not always a good person. I'm not kidding when I say that every day all of us find more and more inconsistencies in our friendship and things that just don't make sense. It scares me because she did get me to open up to her a little bit. It's private information in my real life that things I was going through that she got me to open up on. Kudos to you, Shannon, for a uh, able to get people to open up to you so personally, all the while you're going on sites, trash talking people who were your friends. Who is this person? Who, oh, Shannon, who are you? You know what sucks too? It sucks when you can't get any damn closure. At first, I, I was like in denial. Like I, I was like, eh, nah, no way, no way. And then I was like confused. And then eventually I was like sad. And then I was more sad. And then I started to become more confused again. And then I got a little bit angry and then more angry. And then I'm mostly over it now. I guess it's still weird to talk about. Who I thought I knew, I didn't know at all. Shannon, you lied to my face, and I feel like you should be ashamed for what you've done. Uh, which, by the way, she makes multiple comments about my dick, my penis. I don't know why Shannon is obsessed with my penis. Maybe her husband isn't able to fulfill her needs. Um, but yeah, for some reason, she's really fascinated by my, my cock, and I don't understand why. And we shouldn't blame them or shame them or even fucking expect them to have an opinion on any of this. They were already hurt that they had lost their friend, and then the internet came down on them. And in some cases, the internet is still coming down on them. And at this point, all of us are just fucking done. We are done with Shannon. We are done with hearing her name. We are done with seeing her brand everywhere. And not only has she hurt her friend, but she's hurt fellow artists as well. Something that really bothers me is that in Shannon's unedited Google Doc, she goes on to accuse Skittles Juice, an artist that she had commissioned and never paid in full, of being a scam artist. She claims that she had sent Skittles $250 for the first payment of a commission, but implies that Skittles lied and said they did not receive the initial payment so that Shannon would send another payment and Skittles could then keep both payments. Skittles shows receipts that they actually did 
not receive the first payment when originally scheduled, and that Shannon not only acknowledged this, but also said she had sent the payment to another artist by accident. Shannon then sent over the $250, Skittles completed the commission, but then Shannon disappeared before Skittles could collect the second payment of $250, as the commission was priced at $500 total. It's laughable that Shannon is trying to call Skittles Juice, an incredibly talented and reputable artist, a scam artist, when she herself allegedly scammed one of her viewers out of $400. And to be fair, this is completely unrelated to any claims made against me specifically, but this person came to me with valid evidence and I believe they have a right to be heard, especially after Shannon tried to call another artist a scam artist. This ex-fan, who I am going to call M, had reached out to Shannon wanting to support her channel in some way. Shannon and M agreed that M would send Shannon $400 and Shannon would do a speed paint of M's character in one of her videos as well as give M and their passion project a shout out. Shannon posted a video but only gave M a shout out and did not fulfill the rest of the agreement. The creator of this project is incredibly passionate about it and has put some of her own life savings, actually most of her life savings, into it. But I'm going to include links below so you can follow their Twitter for updates, see exclusive scenes first, and get a link to their Indiegogo campaign, which is trying to raise more funds so they can afford to put finishing touches on the movie and make it the best it can be. Like I said, the creator of this project poured her life savings into this, which amounts to over $15,000 of her own money going into this project. M very gently reminded Shannon of the speed paint at a later date, but Shannon claimed she was not able to make a full speed paint at that point in time, but she would eventually make a dedicated art piece closer to the release date of M's passion project. She made sure to let M know that she would be doing it unpaid. And the unpaid part just rubs me completely the wrong way because this is what Shannon owed M in the first place, but she was now regarding it more as an act of charity than the completion of a commission. Time went by and Shannon stopped responding to M. M even allegedly tried to donate additional money to Shannon during her live streams in order to try and get Shannon's attention. After that interaction on Discord, Shannon went on to unfollow M on Twitter and M never received the rest of her commission. Shannon or no Shannon, this happens to artists way too often, where we will complete a commission and then come forward to collect the rest of the payment, but the person will have disappeared off the face of the earth. It's unacceptable in any capacity and needs to be called out, especially since Shannon kind of fucked people on both sides of the coin here. With Skittles Juice, she never completed the payment, even though Skittles Juice did the work. And with M, M gave Shannon money, but Shannon never completed her side of the agreement. It seems as if Shannon does a tremendous amount of not only flat out lying about other people, but also projecting. It's as if she was grasping at every straw she could, at every angle she could, even if doing so portrayed a very skewed version of the truth. What I find frustrating is that in my video, I make sure to regularly give disclaimers throughout that, although the evidence may be damning to me, that doesn't necessarily mean everything that I was showing had to have come from Shannon or Anthony, and I urged people to draw their own conclusions. I did the this both at the start of the video and at the end. Everything in this video is alleged. I just encourage people to look at the evidence and form their own opinion. I will warn you, I do not have all the receipts for everything. I have a very good handful of receipts. I have to say allegedly for Shannon to protect myself legally because even though there is, I feel like, a lot of proof pointing in that direction, obviously nobody could say at any point, you know, when did Shannon potentially partake in any of this? Again, I'm going to repeat, I have no idea if at this point Shannon was involved or not. I was actually, if anything, I was concerned about Shannon and I mentioned that in later receipts. Um, I was worried because I, I know how Andrew can be. So unfortunately, yes, some of this is hearsay. Something said in this video are personal suspicions and feelings. I encourage you to take all the evidence I provided here in my previous video on Twitter, as well as the multiple testimonies from witnesses to the suspected stalking and harassment and draw your own conclusions. I made and continue to make a genuine effort to correct any sort of accidental definitive language, obviously because I don't want to be sued, but even more so because I realize there are coincidences and inconsistencies in this world and I don't think I could sleep at night if I tried to double down and claim that all my evidence is a thousand percent factual instead of maybe it being a coincidence or a misunderstanding. Shannon does none of this. She creates a very disjointed mosaic of my life using social media fragments as her medium. Where there are gaps, inconsistencies, or misunderstandings, instead of giving even a shred of leeway in my direction, she finds another random, unrelated social media fragment and tries to force the piece to fit the portrait she wants you to see. As they say, there are three sides to every story. 
my side, your side, and the truth. And I'd be foolish if I didn't acknowledge that. Also, I realize the quote goes on to be like, and no one is lying. Memories serve everyone differently or some bullshit like that. But in this case, someone is pretty maliciously lying, at least at some points. But we can't have an unbridled, rage-filled character assassination Google document without a little bit of lying, right guys? But seriously, I'm doing my best to be fully transparent and acknowledge the many mistakes that I've made. I also am fully willing to admit that some of the harassment I have received over the years may not have come from Shannon or Anthony, and there were a few times I was definitely reaching. Though in my video, I stand by the fact that I chose to include the most damning evidence to me, especially because it correlates in time with her lolcal postings. I also realize my timelines might not be 100%, but this is something I was also very clear about in my original video. This has happened over the course of a decade, and I was the one being stalked, so I haven't meticulously mapped out every second of Shannon's life, every mistake she's ever made. Every time she farted and tried to pretend it was the chair squeaking, I don't have that, and I'm not interested in ever having that. My goal wasn't to smear Shannon's character, it was for people to believe me. Though I do admit to getting frustrated at one point in my video, but to be fair, she was coming after my kids and the mama bear just popped right on out. Something that I haven't seen many other people mention, something that I feel throws Shannon's false portrait of this unhinged compulsive liar right into the garbage, is that she is nothing. Not one shred of recent evidence that paints me in a bad light. The last piece of Emily Bad ends about six years ago, in line with when I turned my life around and started making better choices. Lord knows she still has an absurd amount of recent information on me, but none of it she was able to use because none of it makes me look bad. And I'm not trying to say that I'm perfect and that I haven't made a mistake in six years because I have fumbled and fallen plenty of times since then. What I'm saying is I've done done and continue to do the work. I've analyzed my past actions, I've mulled over the hurtful things I've said and done, and I've tried to be better. So Shannon, if you want to sue me, then sue me. If you want to spend months, possibly years, fighting it out in court, spending thousands of dollars that we, you, me, and our families don't have, then go ahead. Bury us in legal fees. Drag this drama on. Refuse to move on with your life. I don't care. I want to be done with this. I want to be done with you. I want to detach you from me like a barnacle from a ship. I've come forward. I've said what I need to say. That's all that matters to me now. All I know is that now you've put all of this out on the table, you have nothing left to hurt me with. I could be living in a shoebox and I would find a way to be okay because of the people that love me. That is all that matters. I'm done with this whole shit show and I'm ready just to return to my regular life. This is the last time I'm going to talk about this on my channel. For anyone who's worried, I have done an extensive amount of work to relocate and other unfortunately drastic things to hide my identity and whereabouts. I have just overall gone above and beyond to protect myself and keep my family safe. I want to thank every single one of you for supporting me, asking questions, being objective, and overall for being genuinely kind people. Your kindness and support has taken me so far and I would not be able to do this if it weren't for all of you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to stay out of trouble. See you guys later.